A carload of friends out for fun the day after Thanksgiving. And a day of family celebration for a middle-aged couple. But when their worlds collide, it suddenly turns to tragedy. A life is lost. I just dropped the phone and I started screaming and wailing. Investigators are left with a mystery. I know one vehicle's here and I know another vehicle's not. And lives are changed forever. That was the worst drive of my life. It's just, you know, you're hoping and praying for the best. Welcome to 2020 on ID presents Homicide. I'm John Quinones. On November 23rd, 2012, a carload of four young friends are hanging out and playing music. It all seems harmless enough. But what was supposed to be part of their Thanksgiving break suddenly becomes a tragic turning point when fate crosses the paths of two different people from two different worlds. In an instant, families who had been strangers are brought together by a senseless act that many are still at odds to explain. Byron Pitts brings us a story. Jacksonville, Florida, forever warm and sunny, even in November. It's the day after Thanksgiving, November 23rd, 2012. 17-year-old Jordan Davis and his friends, Leland Brunson, Tevin Thompson, and Tommy Storms are headed for Jacksonville's popular St. John's Town Center Mall. He was going to go to the mall with his friends and see his girlfriend who works there. Jordan's parents, Lucia McBath and Ron Davis, are divorced. Lucia is spending Thanksgiving in Chicago with Jordan's stepfather and her relatives. Jordan kept saying, Mom, change your plans. Don't go to Chicago. And I kept saying, Jordan, we can't tell our family we're just not going to show up. You come and go with us. No, Mom, I don't want to go to Chicago. I don't want to. I'll just stay here with my dad. Jordan is hoping to find some Black Friday bargains at the mall and ask his dad for an advance on his allowance. And he said, Dad, I need some money, you know, need some cash. Come on, Dad, you know, I'm going to be with my friends. While Jordan, Leland, Tevin, and Tommy mingle and scour the Black Friday sales, in another part of town, 45-year-old small business owner Michael Dunn and his fiancée Rhonda Rauer attend the wedding of Michael's son. Michael Dunn and Rhonda Rauer had arrived early afternoon to get a hotel room, which they had made express provisions for because they had a new puppy with them. Michael had driven 170 miles to his son's wedding. A bit of a romantic. He had hoped it would soon be him and Rhonda who would walk down the aisle. To his dedicated daughter, Rebecca, Michael Dunn is the perfect father. He loved life. He loved everything. He was very nice, always there, always there to help. Michael and Rhonda leave the wedding at around 7 p.m. Back at their hotel room, their new puppy is now surely in need of a bathroom break. Also around 7 p.m., Jordan, Leland, Tevin, and Tommy have finished shopping and leave the mall. On their way back to Jordan's to play video games, they stop at a nearby gas station and convenience store. While Tommy goes in the store, Jordan, Leland, and Tevin wait in the red SUV, enveloped in the loud strains of Chicago rapper Little Reese's hit song, Beef. The boys had the whole weekend off, and uh, they were going to party. In route back to their hotel, Michael and Rhonda pull into the same gas station convenience store. Michael's small black Jetta parks close to the red Durango, now vibrating to beef at full volume. Rhonda Rauer gets out of the vehicle uh, to go inside. Michael Dunn stays in the vehicle. Inside the convenience store, Rhonda Rauer is buying wine and chips to take back to the hotel. It's there that just for an instant, Rhonda crosses paths with Tommy Storms. Seconds after Tommy leaves, a loud volley of gunfire shatters the night. Then the piercing screech of tires as the red Durango carrying the four young men tears away. Suddenly, more shots. Rhonda rushes from the convenience store to see what's happened. 
The Jacksonville 911 line is flooded with panic calls. Jackson 911, messengers are gunshots at the gate gas station. We had shots fired in the parking lot. It was about, what, nine shots? Pop, 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 pop. I don't know if they were trying to stash something in the car. We're shooting out of the vehicle at somebody else, but we don't know what happened. At this point, no one does. Moments after the gunfire ends, the four boys in the Red Durango vanish. So too have Michael Dunn and his fiance Rhonda. Within three minutes, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Department arrives. Detective Mark Musser is among the first on the scene. When you pull up, what do you see when you get here? We had approximately five casings over in the parking lot area. A uh, little bit of blood on the ground. Also in the parking lot is the Red Durango. Witnesses say it returned minutes after Michael Dunn's Black Jetta left. Laying on the ground near the Durango is one of its young male passengers, bleeding from multiple gunshot wounds. Hi, I need an ambulance at the gate gas station. So what's going yeah, on? Someone, someone got shot. Paramedics rush to attend to the gunshot victim lying near the bullet-riddled Durango. It's 17-year-old Jordan Davis. He had been sitting in the passenger side back seat. Jordan was laying on the ground where they're getting CPR. By some miracle, Leland Brunson and Tevin Thompson have not been hit. Tommy Storms came dangerously close to being shot, but he too somehow manages to escape injury. As the vehicle's starting to move, that angle is actually probably what saved Tevin Thompson's life because the angle rounds weren't able to penetrate all the way through the door. So that's probably why Tevin in the front seat wasn't hit. But the three bullets that go into the passenger side where Jordan is sitting do penetrate the door and Jordan's body. One bullet hits his liver, one his lung, and the third, his aorta. Jordan's father, Ron, rushes to the hospital to be with his injured son. That was the worst drive of my life. It's just, you know, you're hoping and praying for the best that he just had maybe a flesh wound or something like that. You're just hoping for anything. But what he hears is far from what he had hoped. All I remember hearing the doctor say is, Mr. Davis, I'm so sorry we were unable to revive. And I, he said a whole lot of stuff after that, but that's all I heard. Then the phone call no parent should ever have to receive or make. Ron tells his ex-wife, Lucia Macbeth, Jordan's mother. It was about 10.45, and I saw my phone light up, and I saw Ron uh, on the phone and I picked up the phone and he said where are you and I said I'm standing here in the bedroom why at that moment I was like where's Jordan you tell me right now where's Jordan what's wrong with Jordan <laughs> and he said Jordan's in the hospital and I said in the hospital why is he in the hospital what happened and he said, Jordan's been shot. And I just dropped the phone and I started screaming and wailing. I was like. With the shock and horror of his son's death still raw, Ron is taken to see his boy's body. When I saw him, he was laying there peacefully. And I walked over and they, they told me not to touch him, you know, because it's a homicide investigation. And I said, I'm going to touch my son and I hugged him, and I kissed him, and I said, you're going to heaven, you're going to see God. And I just broke down, and um, that was the last time I saw my son. While Ron Davis and Lucia Macbeth struggle to deal with their loss, Jordan's friends are still traumatized. Tevin's Thompson, Tommy Storns, Leland Brunson, they were already at the police memorial building. Obviously, the three other boys clearly knew Jordan had been shot, but they had no idea at that point in time that their friend had passed away. Now dealing with the homicide, investigators start to surmise what triggered the shooting. Based on your past experience, what were you thinking the possibilities were? I don't know if these people were targeted. I don't know that they haven't threatened somebody and somebody returned fire. I don't know that. As to who was shooting or why, at first there are no obvious clues. Obviously, we had the, you know, the vehicle, the red Durango was present uh, with obvious multiple bullet strikes uh, to the passenger side of the vehicle and some to the right rear of the vehicle, and that there were shell casings located in the parking lot. So we knew we'd had some kind of dispute had occurred but where is Michael Dunn and his fiance, Rhonda Rowe? I know one vehicle's here, and I know another vehicle's not. 
when we come back. It was two worlds colliding that night. Discovery. A trip by four friends to a popular Jacksonville shopping mall on Black Friday, November 2012, has ended in tragedy. 17-year-old Jordan Davis is dead, the victim of a violent shooting, possibly a drive-by killing. It appears uh, both suspect and victim strangers did not know each other. A second vehicle, a black Jetta owned by 45-year-old businessman Michael Dunn, possibly caught in the crossfire, has disappeared. And for now, both Dunn and his fiancée, Rhonda Rauer, are missing. The first thing investigators do was talk to Jordan Davis's friends, Tevin Thompson, Tommy Storns, and Leland Brunson, to try and find out how Jordan died. Talking to Leland Brunson, it was his best friend. Uh, Leland was very quiet, and you could just tell it was really hitting him hard. The other boys, you know, just the sense of shock, you could just see it in their face. And in speaking with them, you could just you could just see the, the almost question of, you know, why did this, why did this happen? Jordan is the only son of Lucia McBath and her ex-husband, Ron Davis. Lucia tries to cope with her heartache by clinging to the last conversation she ever had with her beloved son less than 24 hours before he died. You know, Mom, happy Thanksgiving, Mom. I just want to tell you thank you. Thank you for loving me. <laughs> now Lucia is left wondering how she could be talking to Jordan one day and preparing to bury him the next. Basically, the boys are parked here. They pull in. Tommy Storms gets out to go inside the store, leaves the other three boys in the car. They leave the music playing loud. The music is rapper Little Reese's song, Beef. At some point, Michael Dunn pulls into the spot next to him on the passenger side. Rhonda Rauer gets out of the vehicle. That's when an ordinary evening turns deadly. The music was too loud. Michael Dunn had asked them to turn the music down. Tevin Thompson, who was sitting in the front passenger seat, complied, turned it down. Jordan didn't want to turn the music down. He said, let's, let's turn it back up. I'm tired of people telling me what to do. They turned the music back up, and then there was an exchange of words. At that point is when Michael Dunn and Jordan Davis started exchanging words. And I believe it was Tevin Thompson members hearing Jordan say F you uh, to Michael Dunn. According to witnesses, and there were statements of, you know, are you talking to me, coming from Mr. Dunn? And I believe a couple of the witnesses stated they heard, you know, you're not going to talk to me that way. Suddenly, the argument escalates to a fatal flashpoint. And before anybody knows it, Dunn is leaning over to his right, reaching into his glove box, pulling out a Taurus 9mm. Right about this time, Tommy comes out of the store, gets into the car, straps himself in, looks over, and sees a gun pointed at three feet away. First three were very quick. But the shooting doesn't stop there. But then you had at least four more shots as the car's leaving. Witnesses say Michael Dunn quickly reloads his gun. And then as the truck pulls out and starts to head towards the other part of the parking lot here, he exits his vehicle and fires three more times. He strikes the vehicle in the rear of this vehicle as it's leaving to flee the barrage of bullets. And you can see that he fired several shots into the tailgate. He just missed one of the boy's head when he shot in the back of the car. It landed in the visor of the car, just missing the driver's head. While Dunn is firing at the Durango, his fiance, Ronda Rao, seen here in the convenience store security video, reacts to what's happened. Somebody's shooting. Somebody's shooting on their car. Witnesses hear Dunn order Ronda to get in the car. And among the flurry of 911 callers is one witness who not only sees Dunn targeting the fleeing Durango, they also clearly see his vehicle. The person firing has left, but we did get a license number. So Michael Dunn's name came up when they ran the license plate? Yes. You have a name? Correct. At that point, all I have is a name and his driver's license photos, but it's not enough to say that's the guy. And then what happens? What You show pictures of Michael Dunn to the boys? Yes. Tevin Thompson, the front passenger in the Durango, was actually the one who was able to positively identify 
Mr. Dunn as the shooter. The person police now want to speak to most is Michael Dunn. Jacksonville police are searching for the man who shot up an SUV outside a Southside gas station. Did you think he was on the run? We had the warrant, I believe, signed roughly 3.30 in the morning. That's seven hours after the shooting. You haven't heard, you haven't received the call. At that point, my assumption is, is that he's, he's on the run. He doesn't want to be found. While investigators search for Dunn, Jordan's father, Ron, is with his son's body, searching for strength. Thanks, Jordan, with Mama Cita. There you go. I remember smelling him. You know, it's funny how you smell your children. You know, you just, you do, you want their scent in you. And I smelled him for a long time, and I touched him, and I kissed him. While Ron Davis and Lucia McBath deal with their grief, investigators are eager to close in on their suspect. I've worked justifiable shootings before. And in most cases, those people are still at the scene when you get there. And this is why they, um, why they did what they did. Uh, even people who, in the end, um, may actually be charged with a crime, who think they are justified, are still there. You know, they're there to tell us what exactly occurred. Uh, the fact that he immediately fled from the scene and we haven't been able to locate you know, him at that point we was just trying to see if we could maybe figure out where he was. News of the shooting and Jordan's death spreads across Florida. Has not been identified to them. Then a crucial tip comes in. Jordan's suspected killer could be less than 200 miles away. When we come back. He sprayed the car with, with bullets, knowing that kids were in the car. And I don't know if they're singing or what. They're saying, kill him. Jacksonville Sheriff's Department detectives are hunting 45-year-old business owner Michael Dunn. Witnesses claim he opened fire on an SUV, killing 17-year-old Jordan Davis. Jordan's friends have told police that Dunn started firing at them at a parking lot of a gas station after an argument over the volume of their music. But could a teen's love of loud rap really drive someone to murder? Sprayed the car with bullets, knowing that kids were in the car. And we know from the boys inside the car that, you know, Jordan was yelling obscenities back at him about turning the radio, you know, turning the music up. And I think when when Mr. Dunn said something effective, are you talking to me? I believe Jordan might have responded, yeah, I'm talking to you. Michael Dunn and his fiance Ronda Rauer leave the parking lot immediately after the shooting, not waiting for the police or the ambulance rushing to save Jordan Davis. Jordan's family and friends are left grappling with this senseless shooting. I understand why Jordan argued. I don't agree with him having argued, because there's a matter of respect. But Jordan was always protecting his friends. So in my mind, I believe that Jordan was saying, we don't have to turn our music down because we're not bothering you. We're not doing anything. Let us be. But you didn't deserve to die for it. You know, didn't deserve to die. Tell me about your boy. He was not a perfect child by any means, but he was a good young man. Always the life of the party. People would say, when Jordan walks in the room, the room lights up. You know, he was humorous. He was very sensitive, very intuitive. Mama's boy, daddy's boy? Hi, daddy. He started out mama's boy, but ended up daddy's boy. <laughs> he was just positive and energetic and goofy. He always, goofy. Had, he always had a joke. He always had jokes. Jordan is the face of America just as any other child is. He just doesn't happen to be white America. Was Michael Dunn biased? Is that why he pulled the trigger? If he doesn't have any any accent with African Americans, and so when you don't have any, you just go by what you read or you go back with, by what you see on television, people of color in handcuffs, people doing the wrong thing. You have this fear built up. Then immediately when you heard the loud music, they're going to become thugs and gangsters. Dunn's daughter, Rebecca, rejects any suggestion her father is a racist. Well, besides not being racist, evil, or anything like that, he was pretty much the opposite. He's very passionate and very intelligent, and he just wants to share all of his knowledge with me. But in late 2012, Dunn's life leading up to the shooting may not be quite what his daughter imagined. An amateur pilot, Dunn is forced to sell his second-hand plane because he can no longer afford to repair it. 
And despite going to his son's wedding, the two had been estranged for the previous five years. Immediately after opening fire on Jordan Davis and his friends, Michael Dunn leaves the gas station parking lot with his fiance, Rhonda Rauer. There was no attempt to contact the police and explain his side. They drove back to the hotel, had pizza, drank a bottle of wine, and went to sleep. The next morning, Dunn and Rhonda steal away from Jacksonville. Instead of reporting the shooting to police, they drive to Dunn's rented beachside apartment. He lived in Satellite Beach near Melbourne, Florida. It's in Brevard County. It's about a two, two and a half hour drive south of Jacksonville. Almost 24 hours after the shooting, one of Dunn's neighbors contacts the local police, where it quickly reaches Detective Musser, who calls Dunn. Well, the first question I asked him was, are you still in Jacksonville? And um, he said, no, we had just gotten home a few minutes ago. And he says, something to the extent of, you know, I know what this is about, and you know, but I acted in, you know, in self-defense. Unsure whether Dunn is still armed and dangerous, Detective Musser encourages him to surrender to the nearby Brevard County Sheriff's Office. I knew there was a warrant out, and my thought process at that point is, I don't want to get him so amped up that it puts them in danger. As soon as he hangs up from the call with Dunn, Detective Musser drives more than 170 miles to Brevard County to interview him personally. Obviously, I just kind of want to talk to you about what occurred last night uh, up in Jacksonville. We were on our way back to the hotel when we stopped at that store. Okay. Dunn tells them he stays in the driver's seat while Rhonda goes into the gas station convenience store to buy wine and chips to take back to their room. She's in the store, and there's like a SUV next to us, and um, then the, the music starts. Mm -hmm. And I, I rolled down my window, and uh, I thought uh, it was too late. I asked them nicely, I didn't demand, they didn't, mm -hmm. or else. I said, hey, would you guys mind turning that down? And uh, they shut it off. Mm -hmm. I was like, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's cordial, right? Things cordial. I put my window back up, and um, the guy that was in the back is getting really agitated. And I, my window's up. I can't hear everything he's saying, but, you know, there's a lot of f him and f that and um, f that. F and then the music comes back on. And, you know, I'm just like, don't, don't need any trouble. And, and I don't know if they're singing or what, but it's like um, they're saying, kill him. So I put my window down again, and I said, excuse me, are you, are you talking about me? Um, and it was like, kill that And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still not reacting, but then this guy, like, goes down on the ground and comes up with something. I thought it was a shotgun. And he goes, you're dead, And he opens his door. Dunn claims it's at this stage he's convinced he's about to be shot and needs to defend himself. That's when I reached in my glove box. Mm -hmm unholstered my pistol to an avid, you know, gun guy and all that. And so um, quicker in the flash, I had uh, a round chambered in it, and I, I shot. Do you remember how many times you shot? I shot four times, and that SUV pulled out, and, and like I said, I, in my mind, they got a gun. I was still scared, mm -hmm. and so I shot four more times. As they, were as they were fleeing? Yeah, I still didn't feel safe. I thought, you know, there was another car. I, I didn't know. I mean, I'm in a strange town in a strange area. Mm -hmm. I just had my life threatened. The love of my life is in the store. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't know what's going on. She come outside to see what was up. And I, I was just like, get in the car. We have to go. But when investigators interviewed Dunn's fiance, Ronda Rao, her version of how the shooting played out is crucially different to his. I thought what happened was wrong. This man admitted when to pulling When we come back. Michael Dunn is behind bars on murder and attempted murder charges. There are people holding up signs, chanting. People camped out, basically, in front of the courthouse. People, on Investigation Discovery. Michael Dunn is in custody after fatally shooting Jacksonville teen Jordan Davis in the parking lot of a gas station convenience store. The 17-year-old was with friends in an SUV parked next to Dunn, listening to loud music when he opened fire, 
shooting at the SUV even as it speeds away. Did the boys explain why they stopped here? Because we're a couple hundred feet away from the store. Why stop here? They were getting away from the bullets. They thought they were in, you know, safety, and then it was all hands on deck to figure out Jordan, 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 Jordan. He never answered. And he never answered. Dunn claims he felt threatened by Jordan and his friends and fired purely in self-defense. When investigators interviewed Dunn's fiance, Rhonda Rowley, she says Dunn comments on the loud music, rapper Little Reese's song Beef, as soon as they pulled into the parking lot. What did he say? He said, ugh, I hate that thug music. Okay, and he expressed that concern in the past. Yeah. It annoys him to hear that yeah. music. turned around and all I could see was Michael right and he his car door was open mm -hmm. and he was kind of like facing out the car door suddenly concerned herself Rhonda leaves the convenience store and rushes to Michael where was the gun when you in the car as I was getting into the car he was putting it in the glove box Dunn exits the gas station in a hurry as Rhonda tries to find out what's happened and he said I shot at the car and um I said, what car? And he said, the one with the music. And I said, why? And he said, because they threatened to kill me. And I'm like, I don't understand, Michael. And he just said that he asked them nicely to turn down their music. One of them in the car turned it down. Then somebody in the car said, we don't have to turn, turn our music down for that or, you know, yeah. he said, I feared for my life, is what he said first. Okay. And he said, they threatened to kill me. Okay. Then I asked him, did you hurt anyone? And he said, no, I just shot at the car. Rhonda says back in their hotel room, Dunn takes their puppy for a walk. And I'm expecting any time the, a police officer... Knock on the door. Yeah. As I thought, what happened was wrong. All right. And if... The police officer saw this. He's going to be here, and I'm just, I'm, I've got to prepare myself for this. Any conversation in the room at that point is just kind of silent it's, tension. Yeah, silence. <laughs> Did you all eat dinner? I had a pizza. Okay. Rhonda and Dunn finish their pizza and go to sleep. In the morning, Rhonda sees the shooting on TV. Breaking news. A local gas station. Multiple shots over loud music. Killing 17-year-old Jordan Davis. I, all I hear are shooting, convenience store, loud music, and I said, Mike, Mike, Mike. And I turned around, and he was standing in the doorway of the bathroom, and he said, yes, I saw him. And then I said, we need to go home, because right now I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be arrested, too, okay. because I left the scene yeah. of a crime. Right. The following day, November 24th, 2012, Rhonda is not arrested, but Michael Dunn is placed in custody at the Brevard County Sheriff's Department. A few days later, Dunn is transported back to Jacksonville, charged with three counts of attempted murder and the first-degree murder of Jordan Davis. Why first-degree murder? He didn't go to the gas station with intentions of harming anyone. No, he did not. And that's why you have to really look into the definition of first-degree murder and what premeditation is. Reaching for a gun putting around in the chamber, turning back around, and firing 10 times, that only speaks to one thing, an intent to kill, and that's first-degree murder. Michael Dunn pleads not guilty to the charges. While he sits in jail waiting to go on trial, a similar case involving the shooting of a Florida teenager eight months prior to Jordan's murder is back in the headlines, gathering emotional momentum. Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager, was shot down by a white neighborhood watchman who claimed self-defense. And it's caused a public outcry that spread like wildfire. George Zimmerman, the man who shot Trayvon Martin, claimed he did so in self-defense because he feared for his life. Michael Dunn mirrors Zimmerman's self-defense claim, and by December 2012, for many, the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis have become synonymous. And America's old and bitter debate over race and justice has a new flashpoint. After two years of waiting, Michael Dunn's trial finally begins in February 2014. Soft-spoken and polite, Leland and Tevin admit to the court Jordan did yell at Michael Dunn. Do you recall anything that Jordan Davis said to the defendant? Uh, yes, sir. What was that? Uh, F you. 
but they couldn't hear Dunn. You said you saw his mouth move. Could you hear what he was saying? No, sir. Could you hear uh, what the driver was saying to Jordan Davis? No. Could you hear what Jordan Davis was saying to the driver? No. Mr. Smith, if you'll come forward for me right However, here. one prosecution witness at the gas station convenience store the night of the shooting did. I heard someone yell or someone say something very loud. And what did you hear that person say? You're not going to talk to me that way. As Assistant State Attorney John Guy explains, Smith's testimony is crucial. Why were his comments so important? Because he heard Michael Dunn yell out, you're not going to talk to me that way. And that was immediately followed by the gunshots, which was completely contrary to what Mr. Dunn had claimed. When Dunn gets his turn on the stand, he tells the court the reason no one could hear him is because the music coming from the SUV is not just loud, it's downright deafening. Body panels of the SUV were rattling. My rear view mirror was shaking. Ridiculously loud music. Dunn tells the court he politely asked the young men in the SUV to turn their music down, which at first they did, and so he thanks them. But then Jordan, sitting in the back passenger seat, becomes agitated. Now it got ugly. I hear, I should kill that mother And I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I must not be hearing this right. And I asked him, are you talking about me? And he slammed, I didn't know what it was at first, but when he says, yeah, I'm gonna kill you. Dunn testifies someone in the SUV has a gun. I look and I'm looking at a barrel. And it's aimed right at him. Jordan Davis threatened Michael Dunn. You're dead. This is going down now. With a shotgun barrel sticking out of the window. I said, you're not going to kill me, you son of a and I shot. His biggest concern, Dunn tells the court, is for the safety of the woman he calls the love of his life, his fiance, Rhonda Rauer. I know she's heard the shots. I know Rhonda. It, it wasn't just my life I was worried about, no. Under cross-examination by Assistant State Attorney John Guy, Dunn says he told Rhonda about the gun after they leave the scene of the crime. And when she got into that car, she asked you what happened, right? Yes, sir. You guys were together for three miles, and she was hysterical? Crying, yes. You did not tell her during that three miles anyone pointed any weapon at you, did you? I think I did. I think I was very clear that they threatened my life. A gun. You used the word gun with Rhonda Rauer. Yes, I did. When? I told her on the way to the hotel, I told her um, several times at the hotel. I told her several times on the way home that this was self-defense. That wasn't my question, OK? Tell the jury how many times you told her at that point, don't worry, honey, they had a gun. I didn't say that. Mr. Dunn, the truth is you never told the love of your life that those boys had a gun. You weren't there. Did you? You did tell her that? I said you were not there. Without a weapon, Dunn's self-defense claim falls flat. According to Detective Musser, investigators found no weapons in the SUV the night of the shooting, nor anywhere near the gas station parking lot. My partners actually went out and checked the area where the boys were, see if there's any you know, evidence of anything, check the dumpsters, even photograph the roof so they can't say they threw the gun on the roof. But when Detective Musser takes the witness stand, Dunn's lawyer grills him on that search and accuses him of a shoddy investigation. There's multiple dumpsters, because not only do you have gate, you also have the restaurant right there. Isn't that true? That is correct. All right, well, tell me when they were searched. On, I believe, Tuesday the 27th. So you're saying those dumpsters were searched four days after the shooting. Is that correct? That is correct. Why wait four days to cover as much ground as you did? We hear about the gun that following day. We had nothing that indicated there was a gun to go look for. There you go. Just relax. It's OK. But in a shocking surprise, it's Rhonda Rauer's testimony that stuns everyone. Most of all, Michael Dunn. Everybody was just glued to their chairs. When we come back. Did the defendant ever tell you he saw a gun in that red SUV? Did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a weapon of any kind in that SUV? And Dunn shares his true feeling. So I was in a room with uh, three black guys. So being in a, a room by myself kind of sucks, but I guess it'd be better than being in a room with them animals. Michael Dunn sits in court charged with the first-degree murder of 17-year-old Jordan Davis. 
and the attempted murder of his three friends. Dunn's testimony is that he fired at the SUV Jordan and his friends were in because he feared for both his life and that of his fiancée, Rhonda Rauer. It wasn't just my life I was worried about now. <laughs> but in a stunning twist, it's his fiancée's testimony. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. That is about to see Dunn branded a liar. Did the defendant ever tell you he saw a gun in that red SUV? No. There was no mention of a shotgun? No. There was no mention of a barrel? No. Back in the hotel room, Ms. Rauer, that same night, did the defendant ever tell you that he saw the boys with a firearm? No. Did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a weapon of any kind in that SUV? No. It was a big turning point. People started to think that this was huge on the prosecution's side. Single-handedly destroying the testimony of the man she loves devastates Rhonda. She was obviously distressed. I mean, she was so nervous. She was shaking. Rhonda isn't the only one sobbing during the trial. Jordan's heartbroken parents, Lucia McBath and Ron Davis, were also reduced to tears more than once, especially on hearing the brutal details of how their only son died. What was the cause of Jordan Davis's death? Multiple gunshot wounds. How many separate gunshot wounds did you find to Jordan Davis's body? Three gunshot wounds. The prosecution disputes Dunn's testimony. Jordan was getting out of the SUV to attack him. If Jordan Davis were standing up outside the car, the shooter would literally have to be lying on the ground shooting up between his legs. Is that correct? Well, I would say, yeah, at that, at that same angle. The only way to account for the bullet paths through Jordan Davis's body is that Jordan Davis was seated in the car, leaning over to his left, away from Michael Dunn. No chance he was opening the door? No. After six days of hearing testimony, the jury goes out to deliberate their verdict. While Jacksonville waits for justice. Yeah. No one person has all the right. Waiting on that verdict, there was a lot of tension in the city. My Twitter page, my phone, everything was blowing up. It takes the jury four days to come to a unanimous decision on three attempted murder charges. The state of Florida versus Michael David Dunn. Verdict is to count two. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Verdict is to count three. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Verdict is to count four. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of attempted second-degree murder. But on the charge of first-degree murder for shooting Jordan Davis, the jury fails to commit. They weren't able to come to a decision on that first-degree murder charge. According to one juror, the arguments over the first-degree murder charge became heated. People were yelling. Oh, yes, sir. Screaming? Oh, yes, sir. Profanity? Oh, yes, sir. For Jordan's parents, the failure to get true justice for their son is another heart-crushing disappointment. You could tell they were devastated. Just looking in their eyes, they were heartbroken. Did they really understand the truth? And the truth was? The boys were being teenage boys, thumping their music loudly. They have a right to enjoy their music in whatever shape or form they want to. Jordan raised his voice. He was cussing, no doubt. But he never threatened the defendant. He disrespected the defendant. Should he have cursed? OK, maybe he shouldn't have. But does he deserve a death sentence? No, absolutely not. Jordan's parents refuse to surrender. Where does the fight go now? We will go back to court. You want to retry? Yes, we're definitely going back to fight for Jordan. While Dunn sits in prison awaiting the second trial, the state's attorney's office releases evidence not presented at the first trial. Phone calls and letters from jail, which the prosecution claims gives a damning insight into Dunn's deep-seated prejudice against African Americans. And so I was in a room with uh, three black guys. So being in a, a room by myself kind of sucks, but I guess it'd be better than being in a room with them animals. In a letter to his daughter, Dunn writes, this jail is full of blacks, and they all act like thugs. But if more people would arm themselves and kill these idiots when they're threatening you, eventually they may take the hint and change their behavior. Michael Dunn has a very limited view and scope about who is valued and who isn't in this country. He only saw the color of Jordan's skin. Protesters incited by Dunn's inflammatory words take to the streets once again, demanding justice for Jordan Davis. They are inspired by the unyielding resolve of Lucia McBath and Ron Davis. They're not just pushing for justice for their son. They're pushing for justice for all young African-American men. Michael Dunn should do the time. Murder is 
a crime. In September 2014, Dunn returns to the witness stand, this time for a leaner trial. Both sides cut the fat. Prosecutors reduced the witness list significantly. They hammered hard on the points that they thought worked well during the first trial. At the end there, you said you can't say for sure what it is. Sure, I, I just saw the top. But today, are you sure it was a shotgun? Yes, I am. After four days of testimony and five hours of deliberation, this time the jury comes back unanimous. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. There's just this widespread relief. A small but loud group of demonstrators outside of the Duval County Courthouse became emotional when they saw Jordan Davis's parents walk down the courthouse steps. We're able to finally give him rest and closure. On October 17, 2014. And Mr. Dunn, your life is effectively over. The life sentence is in addition to a 90-year sentence for the three counts of attempted murder of Jordan's friends and 15 years for firing at a vehicle. The tragic end of Jordan Davis's young life has marked the beginning of a new one for his parents, Ron Davis and Lucia McBath, as outspoken activists. This that has happened is way beyond us. Lucy refuses to just let this be a chance encounter. I have to forgive. Never forget, but continue to walk out the legacy for Jordan. Hey, what are you doing? Where are you going there? You going somewhere, kid? As of 2016, Michael Dunn is continuing to appeal his first degree murder sentence. Dunn's lawyers claim jury bias tainted his second trial. Rhonda Rauer is no longer engaged to Dunn and has moved on with her life. Jordan Davis's parents continue to work together, campaigning for justice for all young men of color and have established the Jordan Davis Foundation. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID presents Homicide.